the Pen Parentis Literary Salon for November. And uh, I'm M.M. DeVoe, and this is Christina Chu. You yeah. see how it only took me a few years, and I actually know how to point the wrong way so that it goes <laughs> the right way on the screen. Very impressive, I know. Um, all of you who are out there in viewer land, hello. We have already heard from Annie Brooks, who has said Taylor Hobbs is my favorite author. So that's pretty great. Taylor knows that. She uh, was very excited to see that. Um, we have such an amazing show for you guys tonight. Today is a wackadoo show. We have three amazing authors and we have two extra special people. Um, we have last year's Pen Parentis Fellow, who we'll be introducing this year's Pen Parentis Fellow, and you get to hear the winning story, and that is super special. And so we're very glad to bring that to you. Um, as usual, on the top of the hour, we always thank our sponsors. And so from the bottom of our heart, thank you to the DeGroat Foundation and to the Poetry Foundation for funding us. We love you guys. We love poetry. We love everything the DeGroat Foundation does. Um, actually, the DeGroat Foundation will offer 36 unrestricted grants this year. 36, two writers who are writing in 2024. Their, um, their foundation opens their, um, what is it called? Their portal opens on January 7th. So everybody who is a writer out in writer land, uh, please make sure you apply for those special writing grants. And, and they started doing this Lando grant in addition to their usual courage to write grant. And the Lando grant is for any writer who is writing about, um, uh, uh, migration, immigration. immigration, immigration, migration, or refugee crisis. So if you write about those things, they have special money for you. Yay, money. So, uh, you know, go get that. Um, and also, Clydette is in the front row. Hi, Clydette. Oh, <laughs> and um, also, I want to thank Candy, Janet, Corinne, David Harris, Jenny, and Melanie for making donations on your way in tonight. We really appreciate you. And hi, Loretta, <clears throat> and hi, Shay. Thanks so much for, for dropping your name into the chat. Uh, do, do let us know you're out there. Uh, anything that you put in the chat, we can see viewer land. Hi, Sydney. Oh, Drew, it's good to see you. Thanks for joining us from whatever crazy time it is in Sydney, Australia. Um, Christina, I think that maybe we can start to bring our authors up. What do you think? Sounds good to me. We start introducing people. So uh, we have three readers tonight. Our theme is collateral damage. Uh, we're going to be looking at the different kinds of um, ways that authors are actually working on this theme. So our first reader will be Nancy Ludmer. She's a memoirist and a short story writer. Nancy's debut collection, Collateral Damage, 48 Stories, was the 2022 winner of Snake Nation Press's annual fiction prize. Her novella, Sarah Coppola, A Lock in Life, is forthcoming. Our second author will be Michael Bourne. He's a nonfiction writer and novelist. He's the author of Blythedale Canyon. And finally, we have Marina Budos. She's an award-winning novelist and nonfiction writer. Her novel, We Are All We Have, was a Kirkus Best Book of 2022. And everyone, please welcome our three authors. Yay! Um, Yay! Um, and I'm super excited about it. Yes. And then uh, we here's will, our special special. Yeah, go ahead. So go ahead. we will we will come back to our authors um, in a minute, but uh, we just want to announce that we have our uh, fellowship every year. And this year we are going to present our new our fellowship winner. Okay, yeah. so take um, it away. So as you all know, Pen Parentis is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we are here to help writers stay on creative track after they have kids. That is what we do. That's why all the people that we present at these salons have kids, all these people have kids. We're gonna ask them about their work-life balance. We're gonna ask them how the heck they wrote 10 books when they have kids. We wanna know everything. And, um, and also, you wanna know everything. So if you are here live, that's why you come live. You get to ask questions. So make sure that you get those questions going and be ready for them when we, when we call for them. Um, right now, one of the other things that we do in our, in our offerings for writer parents is we present a fellowship once a year. We present one person with a $2,000 prize. It also includes a year of mentorship 
It also includes publication in a fantastic, gorgeous, full color, like amazing full color journal called Dreamers Creative Writing Magazine. It is published in Canada. That means you get an international publication. It is a really cool fellowship and uh, Sarah will tell you all about it. I will tell you about Sarah. She is a last year's fellow. She was born in the Ozarks in Arkansas as one of nine children who were raised without indoor plumbing or electricity for a lot of her life. Uh, and then she attended Yale University and got her MFA at the University of Ooh. Iowa. So, and then she won her fellowship um, and, her <laughs> and her essays. Uh, are very widely published. She is a fantastic human being. I love her personally. I know her now because she lives in the Bronx and um, and and we sometimes meet there. Um, so uh, so I would like to introduce Sarah, who is going to read a little letter to our fellow. But um, I suppose I should bring up our fellow. So our new fellow is Taylor Hobbs. Taylor Hobbs has published wait 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 i have to find her bio it's really extensive um she primarily she says she primarily writes novels we are just in love with this and uh she just finished her seventh book a few months ago um the short story that she wrote for us she has already expanded into novel length thank you very much you're going to be hearing that story in a minute and um and the novel is called What I Would Do For You, and she is currently querying it. Do you hear that, all you agents out there or friends who have agent friends? Let them know. Um, she's also got two novels out with Wild Rose Press called Cloaked and Sonder Village. And uh, now she mostly writes YA, um, but she is she's a super amazing writer, as you will soon see. But first, Sarah Corto has a letter to read to Taylor Hobbs. Take it away, Sarah. <laughs> Well, I was so touched by the letter that the previous fellow um, wrote to me last year. And um, I'm hoping I can pass on some of that mojo. So dear Taylor, congratulations on your selection as the 2024 Pin Parentis Writing Fellow. We don't know each other, but we are both writers and mothers. So perhaps we are not complete strangers. When my daughter arrived in 2021, I was over the moon, but also anxious about what it meant for the creative flame I've nurtured throughout my life. My own mother, a talented visual artist, largely abandoned her art to raise her children, other than producing the occasional hurried sketch of a sleeping baby or an over-the-top paper mache pu puppet. <clears throat> Despite the very different path my life has taken, I was afraid that motherhood might mean the same for me as it has for so many women. To get the call that I'm writing that meant something to me, was incredibly validating. I wasn't familiar with Pin Parentis before I entered the fellowship competition. To be honest, it's all about the prize money, which was nice, but the community I gained has been the real prize. The accountability group I joined as one of the perks was wonderfully supportive, full of ideas, and sometimes just encouragement. And I urge you to join one if you possibly can. Uh, the paid registration for AWP was another boon. I found myself wandering from panel to panel, taking notes and dreaming like I was back in grad school. Go if you can. But look, you'll figure out how to use the fellowship on your own, and Milda is a wonderful and generous guide. I want to take a minute to tell you a couple things that aren't evident from the website or the very much deserved hoopla. One is something that Kelly Clark, last year's fellow, said in her letter to me. There are ebbs and flows, and that's okay. There are some days when you just be proud of yourself for still trying. But more importantly, I want to pass on something that my massage therapist has written in lipstick on the mirror in her office bathroom. Hey, we take inspiration where we can get it. You are enough. The fellowship is recognition of who you already are, not a coronation. Unlike being a parent, being a writer is something you must choose every single day, every time you sit down at your desk or tap a few sentences into the notes app on your phone. And unlike the kiddo nagging you for Cheerios, or in my case last night, pleading for me to return the booger I had swiped from her hand so she could eat it, no one is posted at your shoulder demanding your words. Sitting down at your desk is a discipline you impose on yourself because you have something to say, and because a writer change, being a writer changes the way you see the world in ways big and small, much like being a parent does. And you're already doing it. The fellowship is wonderful, Taylor, but it's no more than you deserve because you are already enough. In fact, because we aren't really strangers, I can say with confidence, you're kicking ass. 
So go on out there and keep doing it. And I look forward to reading your work. Oh, <laughs> Yay! that was amazing, Sarah. Thank you so much. That was so sweet. <laughs> I'm really touched. I tend to like get really emotional and burst into tears. I mean, when Milda called me that I won, I definitely was just like, I did the same. <laughs> <same. laughs> Yay. And now we get to hear Taylor read her winning story. Are we ready, Taylor? I don't, yeah. I, I don't. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay. Um, so my short story is titled Contingency Daughter. Um, it's at 529 words. Um, just too shy of the, the maximum this year. <laughs> All right. Um, my sister lays with her head on my mother's lap on the bathroom floor. Her mouth is wide open while my mother works the floss between each tooth, diligently, lovingly, but sometimes the gums can't help but bleed. I step over them to snag a hairbrush off the counter and my sister's eyes track me. Her silent question asks, where? I'm going out, birthday celebration at Beth's. A kegger in the woods, to be specific, nothing like the Elmo birthday my sister insists upon as she gets older, but does not age. My mother ages faster than she gets older Tired hands working the same nightly ritual for the last 20 years. Clip fingernails, take to toilet, turn on the nightlight, tuck into bed, tick, 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 toward my countdown. Sing a lullaby, kiss goodnight, surrender to dreams. I pull my hair into a tight ponytail and give my reflection a once over. My mother interrupts my critical inspection. What time will you be back? Throwing a floss away, she reaches for the toothbrush next. By curfew not a minute sooner. Reaching down, I thrust my hand out and wait for my sister to fist bump me. She grins. Hell yeah. Her knuckles crash into mine. Tomorrow, I'll return with tales of misspent youth that need to stretch large enough to encompass both of us. An impatient horn sends me running from the room, down the stairs, and into the star-filled night. The other girls whoop as I throw myself into the back seat of Leah's car and we escape our non-existent pursuers careening around curves until crunching gravel slows the tires before we can drive into the bonfire. A handsome distraction thrusts a red cup under my nose as I open the door and swing my feet toward the ground. White sneakers land in the dirt, but I am floating. He takes my hand and leads me towards the flames, my steps already matching the rhythm of the music blasting through the speaker. I dance with my Dionysus, spinning until I no longer know which way is up. I'll be right back, he says, squeezing my hand and giving me a wicked smile. But he'll return to the spot to find me gone because I can't resist the dark, quiet forest anymore. Slipping into the shadows, I start running until the music and laughter fade. Glass shatters in the distance and I duck, even though dinner and my sister's meltdown were hours ago. I fall into the beat of my breath and pounding heart while paper leaves swirl in a colorful wake. Turning them up does not make them disappear, just like how crumpling the black and white forms I found in my mother's room will not change my fate secondary guardian to be signed on my 18th birthday. I'm far enough away from the party now that I can't hear anyone else. And for a little while, I can pretend to be lost. Leaning back against a tree, I slide to the ground and crane my neck upward for a glimpse of the stars. Fingers find their way to my mouth and I chew my nails bloody. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah. And, and you've written so much fiction. And when when I called you and told you that you were gonna that you were the winner of this, what you told me about this story was just so like you were you said you weren't you hadn't ever written about this subject before. Um. So I I had attempted something like this um, in a novel years ago before I became a parent. Um, and I just think that maybe I needed time to grow and to reflect a little bit more and to, to really touch on like the, the truth of this. Um, and I was at AWP listening to all these wonderful people speak about um, memoirs and their experiences and all of these things. And it kind of gave me the courage to attempt this again. And Christina, randomly and miraculously <laughs> handed me a flyer while I was eating dumplings at lunch. And, um, <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe this is the sign I need to, 
to attempt this. And um, so, yeah, I, I tried right. it. It's really my first short story, um, but I, I think that it was... Um, Extremely it, successful I, is what it was. <laughs> it was so, it went through every gamut. And so it's so real, it's so beautiful. And what you've done in the economy of you know, barely over 500 words is astonishing. You gave us a whole mm -hmm. life and a whole cascade of emotions. It's really, really gorgeous. Um, yay. And I can't <laughs> wait to see what you do this year. We're going to follow you and find out what you do and then like talk to you all the time. So this is going to be really good. Um, and now for our regularly scheduled salon, everybody. Thank We're you, Taylor. Taylor. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you for the honor. <laughs> yay, Sarah. Thank you for coming back. And thank you, Sarah. Oh, wait, I forgot to do this. Wait. This oh. is for Taylor. Taylor, you get a thing. You should frame it. An award yeah. just for me. Yay! <laughs> Put it on my desk. Thank you. Yay, from New York to Seattle. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so now that, that that was silly, but that was fun, fun, silly. Um, but really, congratulations. All mm -hmm. right. Let's talk to our established writers who are also established parents and find out everything about them and hear about their newest works. Go, Christina, introduce our first reader. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so our theme is collateral damage and we put together all these salons um, and the themes about a year or year and a half prior to it coming. Um, and so um, it's usually themes that authors resonate with and they choose this particular salon. So um, we're gonna spend some time later talking a little bit about what resonates in their work with this theme. And um, our first reader will be Nancy Ludmer. She, her fiction appears in the Kenyan Review, Electric Literature, New Orleans Review, North American Review, Best Small Fictions of 2016 and 2022. Her fiction has been translated into Spanish and read on public radio. Her stories have won prizes from Master's Review Carve, Hope mm. Literature, Streetlight, Gemini and Orison Books. Her short memoir, Critios, uh, Critios, Critios, Critios Boy, um, was was cited in Best American Essays in 2014. Her debut collection, Collateral Damage, 48 Stories, was the 2022 winner of Snake Nation Press's Annual Fiction Prize. Her novella, Saracopia, A Locked in Life, is forthcoming. Everyone, please welcome Nancy Ludmer. Thank you so much. And I simply must say that Saracopia, A Locked in Life, came to life on October 24th of this year. So it is no longer forthcoming. And Wonderful. And there's questions about it. It's my first venture into a longer form. It's a historical fiction novella. So I'd love to talk about it later. But right now I'm going to read two micro fictions and flash fiction is really where um, I began. I'm going to read two micro fictions from Collateral Damage 48 Stories, um, which was the name of my book before this salon got its theme. <laughs> um, the first I'm going to read is the title story, Collateral Damage. For weeks, the fly got the better of them. When they thought it was gone, it reappeared all abuzz. First that fly witnessed disagreement, then yelling, then coldness, turning away, weeping, someone locked in a bathroom, a swollen lip, hard objects breaking against walls, the fly, to its surprise, was not the target of any of these attacks, not even the last, which for the fly was a first. With humans, it mused, even more than with us, every day is bloodshed. When the woman left, the fly pondered a moment, go or stay. Then the man pounced. Um, the second and last 
story I'm going to read is from the second half of the book. And I can also talk later, perhaps, about the way I divided the book. The first half is called Collateral Damage, and the second half is called In the Repair Shop. Um, this one sentence story is called Bar Mitzvah. When Benji started to choke on a piece of celery stuffed with scallion cream cheese, I turned from the buffet table and asked, are you okay? And when he shook his head, I said, raise your arms, but he kept choking. So I slapped him on the back of his fancy new suit. And then two words clicked in my head, Heimlich maneuver. So I punched my fist into his stomach, even though this was the wrong way to do it, but I couldn't think, couldn't think of the right way. His gray eyes, huge and terrified. I had never seen him that scared. So I cried, we need help over here. Benjamin is choking. And then she was there, Dinah, the wicked stepmother in her fuchsia gown, the airline stewardess, Flight attendant Benji had corrected me once. Don't be sexist, mom. And she clasped her arms around him from behind, behind and jerked back hard. And the celery flew across the room on angel's wings. And I said, thank you, God. While this woman who had wrecked our lives 10 years earlier hugged my son. And I knew then on his bar mitzvah day that for everything, there is a purpose under heaven. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nancy. Did, did you say that was one sentence? Yes. Yeah, it made me think of um, Gar uh, Garcia Marquez has a, a book that's one sentence. Um, I can't remember the title of it, but yeah, I just find that so fascinating that you're able to control it so much that, that you know. When you were writing it, did you choose the sentence structure first or did that happen because of the emotion of it? It is, it is um, a flash fiction or micro fiction I wrote a long time ago in wonderful Pamela Painter's workshop. And the assignment was to write a story in one sentence. And so it needed to be very compressed. It needed to be breathless, but I also was determined to kind of layer in it the past of, of the woman who was telling the story. And so that was the challenge of it. Um, and people sometimes think it's autobiographical, but it, it's not. I mean, there are elements of it. I was at a... Um, a law firm dinner where someone started to choke and the, the lawyer who helped had previously been a airline, a flight attendant, sorry. Um, and, um, but the story, the feelings it deals with in terms of um, being a single parent, um, which I was during almost the all of the stories that are in this book, which is kind of um, collateral damage is kind of a 20 year um, retrospective of everything I've been writing and publishing since from 1996 to 2022. Um, but those feel the feelings are definitely ones that I experienced as a parent, um, which is one of the reasons I, I chose to read that one. It's a terrific so message to see both sides of something, like to see something that you are so unhappy with and still see the good or the other way where you see all this good and then all of a sudden you see some darkness like that's a really it's a really nice uh perspective sorry go ahead christina I don't to just, no i uh, i was just babbling i was just like we, we will randomly. we will come back to you um because i have some questions about that still um i find that really really interesting um our second reader right now is michael bourne He's the author of Blythdale Canyon. Hi, Michael. Um, he's a longtime contributing editor for Poets and Writers magazine, and he has written for the New York Times, The Globe, and Mail, The Econ Economist, Literary Hub, and Salon. His fiction has appeared in literary magazines, including December, The Southampton Review, and Tin House. Yoo! Hi, yes. Michael. 
While we, while we arrange the things, I want to just check in with our audience out there because we had a really interesting comment. Jennifer Zuli wrote in that to Taylor that her children have Down syndrome and that your piece was amazing. Like she really connected to it. Um, and, and also Shea Galloway liked both of the first two readers. So anyway, Michael, please take it away now that you have the stage properly. <laughs> Thank you. I've got a lot to, uh, to live up to here. Um, so I am going to read from Blythdale Canyon. Um, uh, and I was challenging. They asked me to do three minutes. So I'm trying to find three minutes from the book that also deals with collateral damage in, a, in an obvious way. Um, so that was tough. But um, this is really in the we book. We try to make it really hard. Yeah. No, I, I, was, I, was, I was working last night um, trying to find this little bit here. That made sense. Um, anyway, so this is from early in the book. And just all that you need to know is that our hero or, or the, the narrator, his name is uh, Trent, um, uh, is out with his mom in that she who is a he's an addict. She's a major codependent. Perhaps you know this sort of situation. Um, she has just spent spent a whole bunch of her wealthy second husband's money buying him clothes. And they're now at a. Uh, sort of high-end uh, uh, dessert place uh, to celebrate, and he has a kind of a panic attack, and he goes into a bathroom and shoots a couple of uh, airplane bottles of uh, gin, which he calls skinnies. Um, that's, I think, all you really need to know. Um, uh, and so he's coming back out now to face mom. Um, on the terrace, mom was sipping her mineral water, watching the crowds drift by on the drift brickwork mall. At a distance, she too ran to type. In her case, the trim blonde yoga princess whose problems you'd pay to have. But when she turned to me, I saw the private anguish in her eyes, a look as old as I am and as intimate as a hand rocking a cradle. Sorry about that, I said, sliding into my seat. The, the guy that had of me, he, he had his kid with him. Trent, look at me. I was wise enough to bring my eyes up to meet hers. We both knew what she was looking for. And the way we played this game, I had to let her feel like she had free range to knock around inside my brain, see what she could see. What were you doing in there? She asked. I told you, the, the guy in front of me, for 10 minutes? Part of me was ready to call it a day, fall at her feet and let her hold me and tell me everything was going to be all right. But everything wasn't going to be all right. Not if I copped the skinnies I just shot in the men's room. And that old wolfer survival instinct was chanting, maintain, maintain, maintain. You really want to know what I was doing? I said. Yes, in fact, I do. You're not going to believe me. I was praying. Praying? I let the words sink in, marinate a little. It's something my sponsor told me to do, I said. In moments of stress, he says I should find a quiet place and pray. She laughed, but it came out half strangled. My mother had spent her entire adult life, life being lied to by drug addicts. And so, so her bullshit detector was more finely tuned than most. But coming from me, this was such a weird ass admission. It almost had to be true. This is that guy you were telling me about, she said? The priest? Ma, he's been 10 years since left, Frank left the priesthood. He drives a cab, remember? This fact, the image of a defrocked Catholic priest driving a yellow cab, had cracked my mother up the first time I told her, but she wasn't laughing now. She was watching me, the look in her eyes guarded, and at the same time almost pathologically hopeful. You stopped talking about him, she said. I figured you'd given up working with him. Well, I have, but I, I called him last week. All that big book thumping's hard to take, but the man knows his stuff. That my program's getting all out of whack without him. She stared, fighting hard to hold on to his skepticism. The anger had boiled up in her when I left her alone. If I had been anyone but me, she would have already walked off. But I wasn't just anyone. I was me, her only son. And this news that I was taking, talking to a sponsor again and working a program was so hopeful, so wished for, she had no choice but to buy it. What do you pray for, she asked. And it goes on from there, but I'll stop. Um, I, 
that was a great place to stop. I, I should say that logically was... hopeful is a great phrase. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Uh, I should say, I, 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 as I was setting up, it's totally clear in context. He is completely lying. The whole thing is a lie. Um, it's all fiction for him. Um, so I, I realized as I was halfway through, I was like, yeah, you might think he was telling the truth. Now he's lying. And which many books is this? This is your. This is that's actually the Blythe Tokyo is my first book. My first. This book. is your first book. Yeah. OK. Yeah. But you wrote a lot of nonfiction. Write a lot of nonfiction. Write a lot of non journalism. nonfiction books, or yes, no. not books. No, I committed a lot of uh, acts of journalism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good. Uh, we won't hold it against you. Uh, that's that's. I, I teach and I commit acts of journalism. That's my. That's my gig. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. <laughs> oh my God, you're so such a riot. Um, I'm like Marina Budos is our is our final reader. Uh, I've known Marina for many years and I, um, from the Asian American Writers Workshop days, um, I, I heard about her and, and didn't, didn't know her yet, but um, I'm so, so happy that she's here. She's been here before with Pen Parentis and um, I'm always so pleased. Um, like um, a lot of you authors out there, she's so prolific it's almost disgusting um and um and i'm so happy she's here tonight thanks so much marina so marina budos is the author of award-winning fiction and nonfiction. her most recent novel we are all we have was a kirkus best book of 2022 prior to that she published the long ride watched which received an asian pacific american award for literature YA Honor, and is an honor book for the Walter Award. The Professor of Light, um, she, she also published the Pref Professor of Light, House of Waiting, and a nonfiction book, Remix, Conversations with Immigrant Teenagers. Marina's co-authored book with her husband, Mark Aronson, Eyes of the World, Robert Kappa and Gerda Taro, and the and the invention of modern photojournalism was a 2017 Yelsa finalist and nonfiction. Their previous book, Sugar Change the World, a story of magic, spice, slavery, freedom, and science was a 2010 Los Angeles Times Book Award finalist and also a Yelsa finalist in nonfiction. Marina is also the author of Tell Us We're Home, which was a 2017 Essex County YA pick, and Ask Me No Questions received the first James Cook Teen Book Award, an ALA Best Book, and Chicago Library's Best of the Best. Everyone, please welcome Marina Budas. Woohoo! Thank you, guys. You know, it is so hard to find three minutes, I have to say. Yep. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna. I may make a few leaps in what I'm reading, um, just to to just to be polite. I hate when people aren't polite around these things. Um, I am gonna read from "We Are All We Have," and originally I was gonna read from the opening, which actually uses the word "collateral," but um, that would have stretched <laughs> on way too long. Um, <laughs> So just know it's in there in the early pages, the word collateral and the way it's used. And I think this can be enough of a setup is um, my main character who's narrating this is Rania. She is a 17 year old um, Pakistani girl whose mother had sought asylum. Um, and the opening scene, I'm not giving anything away, is actually an ice raid that happens that takes her mother away. And in fact, she hears over the fizzy radio of the um, ICE officers, the word collateral, like they kind of caught her in a net uh, and she was called collateral. So um, I'm actually going to be reading from a memory that sort of prompted all this flight and the collateral damage that happened. Um, it's chapter five and it's an earlier memory um, coming from from when she was growing up in Pakistan. Wait for me. That's what Abu whispered, Abu means father, whispered as he pushed the mosquito netting aside. I pretended to be asleep, scrunched tight in a ball the way I like to do, arms wrapped around my knees. Rania, I promise I'll be back soon and then we will take our trip to America. 
I peeked my eyes open. My mother hovered in the doorway. She was so slender, like a girl with her narrow hips, arms across her thin chest. I could see them, two silhouettes melting in and out as they said their goodbyes. Years later, when I saw the movie, The Incredibles, I was sure that was who we were, a family <laughs> able to stretch and jump and squeeze around any obstacle. We moved around a lot because Abba worked for different newspapers, first Lahore, then Islamabad, and Karachi, my favorite because it smelled like the sea. Later, back again to Lahore. Ami got good at setting up our flats, the plants she would line on the sill, my favorite food she knew how to cook, toast, strained yogurt, and slices of papaya. She taught me how to pick the right one, squeeze the heavy wide part to make sure it was firm and look for speckles of brown. I knew Abu was always going off to do something dangerous. How many times I'd watched him buckle his leather bag, push a cigarette pack into his pocket, and slip away at funny hours. But he always came back. He'd sit at a table, stubbing out cigarette after cigarette, regaling us with his stories of the policeman he bribed to get someone to talk, or the army man who gave him a tip off the record. He'd tell me about the cars with tinted windows that followed his or the time he walked out of his office to find his tires slashed. Ami would smile, but it was a tired smile. She'd empty the ashtray, sit down more chai, and say, don't frighten her, Navid. She doesn't have to know everything. Oh, but she does, he'd say and grin. She should know the nonsense we put up to tell the truth. Later, he'd lift me onto his lap and let me tap his laptop keys. Words, magic words, spilled like starlight over my fingers. This was our special power. Stories and questions. Even when he went on assignment, like this latest one, far away to a region the government didn't want him to report about. After we were going on holiday to America. For several days, Abu would call right on time, every four hours. Sometimes it was nothing. Ami would pick up, murmur a few words, then hang up. That was their system. He always checked in with her. But the morning came when I woke and found Ami still in her clothes from the night before, her braid loosened like a ragged twig. There were dark, ashy circles under her eyes. Abu, I asked. She pressed her lips together, twisted around, and made me breakfast. Then she took me to school and was waiting by the gate when I ran outside. Her hair had been braided, but now she wore sunglasses that she never took off. She brought me right home and then sat, sat out on the balcony under the swaying wash, smoking a cigarette. By evening, I heard her talking fast to other people. Her voice shot up and down like the kites we used to fly on the Karachi beach, but she never cried. And it was only later that I saw her once more on the phone. She didn't say anything, just turned away from me, shoulders bowed. I watched her slowly set the phone down. Abu, I asked, when is he coming back? She twisted around. Now there were no sunglasses, just her eyes bulging and swollen and a wetness glistening on her face. He's not, she told me. I ran from the room, lugged myself on down on my bed, pulled my knees close. If I shut my eyes, I told myself, he'd come back and call out, Good, Rania, you waited for me. Waited and waited so long, I fell asleep. Hmm. Thank you so much, Marina. So here's a question. Um, Nancy was talking about how uh, sh her story germinated from an exercise that she did. How did, how did you come about like you have so many stories. So how did this one come about? Um, you know, I write a lot from the point of view of teenagers and often immigrant teenagers and the fragilities that they're facing. And so it was a sort of, um, I, all I can say is one day I was on a subway um, in going to actually to a school visit in Brooklyn and I literally saw Rania. <laughs> I mean, I had a vision of her. I didn't see an actual person who was Rania, but I saw her and sort of her whole story kind of all of a sudden invented her itself in front of me. 
Um, I knew her father was a, a I, I knew I wanted to write about a family fleeing politi for political reasons, asylum. And I knew that her father was a journalist and had sort of invested in her this power of words. Um, and so I sort of had an image of her. And so that's where it that's where it came from. Um, my other question about this book, um, one of your books is banned. Is it this book? Um, watched. Uh, it was part of a group of books that were banned. I don't know if specifically mine got, but it was part of a group of books that were um, uh, part of a We Need Diverse Books uh, grant that went to a certain um, school district in, uh, I think it was Michigan. And all of those books they didn't want, they didn't want that kind of content. Um, so my novel Watched, which is about a Bangladeshi teenager who becomes uh, an informant for his community, for wow. the police on his community. Well, that's, that's did, yeah. incredible. What? It, how did you know that? Like, did someone tell you? Yeah, so we were contacted, the group of us who were contacted, who had been part of the grant, um, we near diverse books had um, reached out to all of us and asked us if we wanted to sign a group letter to protest this. Um, it may be banned in other places. I mean, given what's going on for all I know, uh, I don't yeah, know. I don't assume yeah. that they tell the authors most of the time. Right. When they're like, they just take the books away and hide them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was recently on a banned book panel and I just want to say, you know, um, other with another author and she was saying that she could tell because honestly, her book sales had gone down. Um, she, could, mm. she could tell and her exactly. offers to go speak and so forth. So that's a very real thing. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, and um, out in the audience, Annie Brooks just wanted you to know, Marina, that she really loved it. She said that was okay. captivating. Thank you. <laughs> go ahead, Christina. Um, so um, let's just go to Michael for a minute. Um, can you add to how you came up with your story? Sure. Uh, yeah. Th so that one um, is a good story. I, I was writing something else that kind of wasn't working. And it's just one of those, just like Marina was saying, it was like I was sitting there and a scene, I, I, I don't, it's in her case, it was a person. In my case, it was a scene. Um, it was this guy. Um, uh, and it's now the opening scene of the book. He's at home in his hometown and working at a fast food place, kind of a McDonald's kind of place. Um, and he sees a girl he was in love with in high school um, who is not working there. Um, and that was the scene. And then I and then like they started to talk and he was an addict and the whole thing kind of happened. Um, uh, it was one of those things where, you know, in a in just and then it was you know it's, i'm sure you all have had this experience like i just like you know i was doing trying not to, i was like not writing i was doing this thing i was not writing and suddenly i just had to tell the story um <laughs> you know um, I, love that. And I wrote like 100 pages in the next three That's days or something like that. you um, just had so, to get it all on the page yeah no and wow. it was like i was like not doing anything for a really long time and then yeah just sort of came Bang, out 100 pages yeah yeah I want to ask each of you to just give our audience some idea of where your children fell in your development as a writer. Like you, you each have kids, you each are writers. How did the, how did the two threads intermingle in your lives? Can you just go through and let us know? You don't have to give us too much detail about your kids if you don't want to. Um, maybe can, we can start with Nancy. Um, okay. Um, so I was thinking about that question and I can thank my son's name is Jonah. Um, I became a single parent when he was two and a half years old. And I was also working as a lawyer full time, um, although it became kind of part time. But at my firm, part time was kind of like full time. So I had my hands full, full time with less pay. <laughs> <laughs> no, basically that. But I I um. But I, and one of the main things about being part-time was I did not have to travel for work. That was a deal. So that meant that even if I worked late, I was there in the morning when he woke up. And that was incredibly important to me. So a couple of ways it affected my writing was that I actually became exposed to flash fiction. And because my time to write was limited to the wee hours or sometimes um, 
if he was with his dad or at summer camp, I would get a week to go on to a, like a writing workshop or retreat. Because of that, I knew, I knew that to perfect something, I really had to write short. Like mm -hmm. I could write short and I could work on it and revise. And I'm like, I revise a million times, even if it's, you know, 500 words or whatever. And so I was able to do that. And I started to have success placing the stories um, um, around the time he was like 10 years old. <laughs> and so then I, I just continued, not every story I've written or published is a flash or a micro, but a lot of them are. So that influenced that. Um, and he, he also, I used bits and pieces of his life. And I think growing up with, when you've got kids, you learn their voices. And a number of my stories are told in a, chi in a child's voice or a teenage voice. And you learn that from being with them. So that's something else. I mean, even that line when he says, don't be sexist, mom, you know, it's just <laughs> like a 13 year old telling his mom <laughs> off. And, um, and so I got a little worried when this book was going to come out because when they're published in like literary magazines, you know, he wouldn't necessarily see it, but he came to my book launch and stuff. And I said to him, you know, I, I want you to know that a few of these stories talk about sort of are, relate to moments. They're not autobiographical per se. And I love what he said. He said, he's a great reader. And he said, mom, I get it. You need to hone your craft. And so that's, that's basically the way, I mean, that um, he's now in his thirties and uh, anyway, so that's, that's, That's so cool. I'm probably very <laughs> proud of his mom, too. <laughs> um, what about you, Michael? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, really similar. I, I'm I'm the, uh, the my son is now 16. Um, and I'm the primary uh, caregiver. My wife has always been the one um, who had the lead job. And uh, so I, uh, and, and kind of like what Nancy's saying, I mean, you know, it, it really, it's not such a big deal now, you know, he's in high school, he's got his life. Um, I don't feel that need to be in his life all the time. Um, so I get a lot more done now. Um, but you know, the Blythdale Canyon took me 15 years to write. Um, you know, and I was working on other things and, and so, you know, that's a definite reason. I mean, you know, it just, it just eats time. It eats bandwidth. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it, you know, I just, it, I couldn't like justify like, okay, kid, watch YouTube for six hours while I get, you know, it just, it, that wasn't going to happen. So I, I, um, it, that, you know, and, and I'm not much one for flash fiction. I, I just never been able to make that work. So for me, it was journalism. That was what I did. That was how I kind of got my hand in. Um, uh, those and also are probably it's a little bit more lucrative to do journalism. It's a little bit more lucrative. It, it, you know, I, I used to be a newspaper reporter, you know, in my twenties. So I have this kind of skill set, um, knowing how to do that. And, um, and that's not something that, that I'm old enough now that that's not something that, that people who I'm competing with really have that skill set. Um, so I was able to get a lot of gigs. Um, and it was, you know, that's very, you can do it. You do it for a few hours. You interview some people, you do, you can write it whenever it was very freelance. And then, um, and then I, I've, I've always, you know, taught, but um, yeah. Do you, it, do you feel it, like it helped much. the book? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Do you feel like it helped your book that you didn't give it up for the time that you kept sort of going back to it? Or do you think it would have been like, I should have put it in a drawer and then come back to it 12 years later and then been like- Well, I mean, I was I was working on other things. So it's not like I ever really stopped, but but um, I mean, what what I've said about this book, it took me forever to write it. And when I you know, I said that, there was that moment where I sat down and wrote that 100 pages. That 100 pages is mostly terrible. And it's really bad. <laughs> um, it's unusable. I didn't really know what I was doing, you know, all those years ago. Um, and so the, the, I had the, the, the process of learning how to write over this very extended period. But I think, you know, going the, the book that I started to write made no sense. Um, by the time that I got to the end of it, I kind of knew what I was doing. Um, and, and that was prolonged 
by in the middle of it, having a job and a kid and a marriage and a life um, that just sort of ate a lot of time. And were you in Vancouver the whole entire time? No, I was in, we were in New York then. Oh. Mostly in Brooklyn. Are you, oh, oh. Yeah. Hey, we lived, in, we lived in Brooklyn for a lot of that time. <laughs> we were, the zero to five was Brooklyn. Um, oh, wow. Uh, which was. And how's the literary community between Brooklyn and Vancouver? Really different. I, you know, I, I, I have not, to be honest, not really cracked the Canada as a whole. I'm not, I'm an American and that, that, you know, puts you out on the outside here. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so yeah, Brooklyn, I, you know, I hit it at a time I didn't have, uh, we didn't have, uh, kids then. And I just dove full in and it was very immersive and fun. And, and, uh, I, it was, it was, this was their early, you know, 2005. It was like booming. Um, it was really fun. It was a really, really fun time. Um, and, um, uh, and so I have not found that, that same community. Um, and I honestly, most of my writer friends are from that time that I've just held on to, you know? Um, That's interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna get back to the writing community when you I was, when you about, talking about parenting. I was talking, say about parenting is that the thing that was really nice was that I grew, I, I entered what I call mommy world, um, but it was a mommy world of really, you know, writer, creative people hmm. um, who were all juggling in the same way yeah. that I was, and that was fun. It's really nice to see, and even from other art forms, like right. to just have creative parent friends is very cool. Um, yeah, Marina, do you wanna? Yeah. Uh, so I have two two children, um, and as of this fall, I became somebody who's an empty nester, which is kind of wild. Um, wow. You know, yeah. Liberation. Yeah. I mean, it's not full emptiness in the sense that my younger son is just a freshman in college. I mean, he does come back and they do come back, but it is very, very different. Um, and I'm actually just, you know, the, literally the last few months have been the first um, months of kind of walking around where these creatures are not sort of sleeping in the next rooms and, you know, just so present every day. Um, but yeah, I would say, I know, you know, be before my first son was born, I had actually published two novels, but I was having a really hard time with the next book and, you know, shelved it. And I, I, I actually went through kind of a, I wouldn't say a drought, but a feeling that I was sort of muted and underground for a while when he was young. I was doing sort of freelance work and journalism, but I wasn't, I wasn't, I'm really a person who needs to work on like long narratives. It's it's what I feel. I, once I set up a world, I want to stay in it. Um, and then this idea for a novel kind of, you know, maybe similar to what Michael went through, sort of tore out of me, um, which was Ask Me No Questions, and it was my first YA. Um, and it was really kind of interesting that the moment when I discovered that was going to be published, um, Literally in the same week, I discovered I that was going to be published. I had gotten a tenure track job to teach, and I was pregnant. And so, like oh. all of it had to happen somehow. Wow. <laughs> and you did uh, it. You did it all. And and so what I find is there's surges and there's ebbs. There's surges and there is ebbs, and and some of that has to do with the children, um, and the phases they're in, which can be more consuming than not. Um, and then just some of that has to do with kind of what's working or not working creatively, um, irrespective of them. Um, so for me, raising my boys and writing has always been intertwined um, for, for sure. And, um, you know, they're kind of used to us, both my, my husband's a writer too, you know, just the laptop comes along wherever, <laughs> wherever we are so you know it's kind of eking it out in some way but um i always think of writing as somewhat uh in fact i enjoyed writing when they were younger because i love the energy of younger children um because even if it's like exhausting there's something you're kind of getting back and teenagers can be challenging <laughs> um, that's so, interesting I want to. So normally, <laughs> yeah. I would not allow Taylor to tell her story this early, but I want you to tell 
everybody how you wrote your first book. Do you know what I'm asking? Do you know the what book I'm no. I just finished? Yes. No, yes. or the <laughs> no, 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 no. The one the you were the the, the boat. The oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So um um I I'm in like the trenches with children right now. I have a three year old and a five year old. Um and so I had been trying to write um before I had my oldest and I like I was on like my third book and I was querying it and um trying to kind of get started with that. Um, and nothing, nothing, nothing. And then I had my daughter and then like three weeks later, I got the publishing contract for um, my debut cloaked with like a smaller um, romance publisher, but it came in and I was like bleary eye, just like, <laughs> like a wreck with this little tiny, tiny baby. Um, and my husband is military. And so he oh, man. out a lot. I was, by myself like <laughs> um so that was really really hard and it was um it i was excited but it was also like really bad timing <laughs> i felt like i had kind of you know gotten off to a shaky start and then couldn't really follow through with that and then it was just like a lot at once and so i would try to get momentum and then kind of fall off and then get momentum and then fall off and then um so recently my husband left the military and um, we've been able to, to move and stay in one place. Um, we lived on a boat before for four years. So I was riding on the, the boat. boat is what you were told <laughs> yes. me. Was it, you, said, you said like when you were going crazy on the boat with these two kids on the boat <laughs> and then you were wow. like, writing was your sanity. It was like, you just like yeah. write. Writing was something that, that was mine like no matter what was happening what was going on um it was part of me that i could take with me you know wherever we were traveling or whatever was going on it was just like this little pillar of sanity um that i could hold on to amid a lot of change all the time um and yeah it was a lot but now we're we're in one place and um i've been able to let's see i've started my third book in the last 18 months so i'm like my brain has come back <laughs> which is really great <laughs> and also i think i'm really really deliberate about my time and where i'm putting energy because if i'm taking energy away from you know being a mom and being with my kids like it needs to be very very efficient um and now that they sleep a little bit better <laughs> then that's also very helpful <laughs> Wait, before um, i have yeah. a question here from Jennifer for the, oh, sorry, Christina, did you want to ask before we ask? No, you can, I, question? The, my, my question was about community as a matter of fact. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jennifer asked for all of you, how important was it to have a community of writers and was it difficult to sustain that or justify spending the time when you had children? Um, well, I mean, as, I, 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 I'll just jump on what I was saying before, which is that I, for whatever reason, the people that I found were also mostly writers. There were some other artists in there, but, and so it was like, uh, that was hugely important. Um, but it didn't, there was no conflict because we were all in exactly, we all had small kids. Um, and, um, and I remember taking play dates with Julia Fierro and some other people and, and, in Brooklyn in some little park and we're like you know, talking about our books and the kids are running around. I mean, it was just, it was so important. Um, yeah. Julia's read for us as well. There you she go. One yeah. Of our early uh, readers. Yeah. 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 You know, um, you know, what's so interesting is that uh, just the other day I met these other moms for lunch, you know, and, um, and it was so strange because they were so into talking about like the kids sports and whatever. And my head just was not there. Like I, you know, I wanted to be talking about like, what are you doing right now? You know, like I, it was so odd. I felt really like out of place and weird. And it, it's, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk a little bit about community because Michael, you're talking about how that can make such a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think that's really true. I think the one time in my life where I stepped away from my people, I got kind of lost and didn't write for many years. And um, it wasn't until I came back into the fold that the writing started to happen again. So I know, I know Marina, uh, and I, I wanna ask you um, first, 
you have you do a lot in the community um, in the literary world, and um, I well, want you to both, talk. right? Christina and Marina are doing an AWP panel on community. Oh yeah, could if we could, if we, it, yeah, maybe it's a good moment to mention it. Remind me the title of our panel, which I created, but I can't remember the title. It's speaking uh -huh. beyond the page, creating community. So um, Marina is excellent at this, and um, maybe you could talk a little bit about yeah. um, your your place in that in that. Yeah, you know, um, so it's going to be an awesome panel. It's on, it's on, I think it's on the Thursday at AWP. And what I was thinking about was- For those of you who uh, don't know what that is, that is a big oh, giant sorry. writers conference, uh, mostly around MFA programs, but at this point it's more open to almost anybody who wants to go. So if you write literary fiction, poetry, experimental fiction, that kind of thing, you might be very interested in attending AWP. It's in Kansas City, Missouri this year. Go ahead, sorry, Marina. You know, the, the the nugget for it for me actually came from, you know, seeing so many of, you know, my writer friends, you know, there's kind of the book tour, right? Or there's the classic like, oh, I'm going to go read at a bookstore and that's successful or not successful. And I think sometimes that's a sort of artificial way to for um, books to be born into the world or writing to be born into the world that I think that there are more organic ways for our writing to be received and talked about and for us to sort of um, expand our connections through our writing. So I was really interested in anybody in, in kind of opening this conversation up about, you know, what are the ways, um, you know, we may do readings or but what are the ways in which we really think outside the box in terms of sharing writing, sharing a publication, doing something. I, I personally know I'm going to be talking about um, that I collaborated with a good friend of mine who is a theater director and she created um, she, and we worked with actors and they performed scenes from my book. Um, one is my book launch, but then later we went into schools um, and we created a kind of program around that. And then I got to also be in conversation with actors about their journey and their relationship to this material. I mean, it just kind of opened things up. And so Marina, I guess- To bring it yeah. back to the question that Jennifer asked about, yeah. did, did like when you were doing this with the playwright, did she also have kids or sorry, theater person? Did she also have like, how, how did that fit in with your idea of family that you were going off and, and spending all this time doing your art? For me, it makes me a better mom, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I will admit that this particular thing that I did um, was when my kids are. It was just this last year, and you know, one is out of the house. Um, you know, I, I, I think that for me, I want to bring it back to this idea of uh, is that we all have to be parents, and I have to say that when my kids were little, really they were my community on some level, and I can't say that. I was quite as expansive as they got older, kind of more time loosens up for the kinds of things that Christina was talking about, where you're starting to reach out more. Um, so I guess for me, there was that really dire need when they're very young, because you, you, you need something, you need to feel like you're in dialogue with other writers. And I think as the kids get older and get more independent, and maybe I, I hope that's an answer to your question, um, they're, they're excited if you're excited, right? It sounds they're like you excited. didn't lose touch with them. Like both Michael and Marina, both of you, sounded like you may not have been very active in your writing communities when your kids were small, but you didn't totally lose touch with them. So that once the kids got older, you were able to reach back out and do collaborations or do spend more time together. Am I wrong? Does that sound like? I mean, in my case, I was, I, the journalism was great because I, you know, I wrote for the millions, I wrote for the poets and writers and that, I, you know, I, I you know, uh, Taylor, I was, I was thinking of you when I, I did an interview with, um, uh, oh God, Jennifer um, Egan years ago and I had a two year old um, and she could hear him in the background <laughs> and and we we're like, I'm trying to have an interview with a Pulitzer Prize winning author 
and my two year old's yapping and um <laughs> and she started asking questions about him and she has kids and and she asked how old he was i said he's two and she's like oh you're in it i always loved jennifer egan ever since that because she's like totally got it you are i love it. her yeah she um, read for she's read for us twice yeah, and totally. once was before her pulitzer and it was hilarious the like that the, when she came back she told us that when she uh when she announced at the dinner table that she had won a Pulitzer Prize, her kids just kind of kept eating like they didn't care <laughs> until, oh until she God. said, like, you guys, it's like winning a soccer tournament. And they were like, oh, oh, mom, that's really great. Like, I just thought it was really hilarious. Uh, Nancy, I don't want to leave you out. Um, did you, I'm sorry, did you have something, Christina, that you wanted to add? No, 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 Nancy, go ahead first. Yeah. yeah, yeah um, what do you feel about? I think that in terms of connecting with other writers who had kids, I think a couple of the people who were really mentors of mine or from whom I learned so much had kids. I'm Nancy Zafras, um, who died a couple of years ago, but was really a mentor for me at various times. Her son, Sam, was a few years younger than my son, Jonah. And um, she would always be interested in hearing what was going on with Jonah and um, and Pamela Painter had a lot of kids. And um, I just felt like this was something that you could do. Um, I think sometimes when I would be attend, and these were, uh, I met a group at the um, Kenyon Review Writing Workshop, which is where I studied with both um, Pamela and Nancy. And we remained close, but they didn't necessarily have kids. I mean, that wasn't necessarily part of it. Um, I was sort of laughing because my son loved to say to his friends, oh, you're having problems with a paper. My mom will help you. <laughs> <laughs> Free writing advice. And, uh, I also mentored, like I really like mentoring and people of all ages. I'm not even going to say young writers, but I've done this for years. And I also was a New York City mentor. And so that was something that I helped a series of high school girls with, um, was, was helping them learn how to write even the five paragraph essay. I mean, some things like that. So teaching, um, teaching people or helping people learn how to write is really important part of my reaching out to the community. And it's something we actually still do. Which organization was that, Nancy? It was the New York City Mentoring Program. Wonderful. Um, I mean, I think, you know, sometimes people don't know how to join a community or be part of any, you know, like they feel kind of disconnected. They don't know how to like connect, right? And, you know, the way I see it is if you're involved with anything, if you talk to people, you'd be shocked how quickly community gets built. But I'm not kidding, Taylor, Tell that story, please. <laughs> um, I was at my first writing conference, AWP in Seattle this year, and my girlfriend and I were taking a lunch break at this little dumpling restaurant. We're chatting about our kids, and Christina just leans over, and she goes, <laughs> excuse me, I work for this <laughs> organization that supports parent writers, and she handed me the flyer. And I was like, oh, great, thank you. We chatted for a little bit. Um, and I had never heard of Pen Friends before. And then I, so I took the flyer and then afterward I went in and I, I listened to these wonderful writers talk about memoir and stuff. And it seemed like a sign, like a big arrow, like <laughs> you should do this. Um, and I, yeah, I never would have found out about it. I wouldn't be here with you wonderful people. Um, if, you know, Christina hadn't reached out to me, like as a writer who felt really out of her depth at her first, writing conference and is worried about our kids back home. Like there was a lot, a lot happening in that moment. Um, so yeah. So reach out, out. reach out to people. It's amazing. It to have a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and the people are out there. I mean, the, the point is, is that the communities do exist. You have to look for them. Some of them are online. Like we're, everything we do is online. So any of you who are out there or are watching playback, like come find us. We're at Penn. And Francis we care Broadway. about you. And we want you to succeed. We want you to write books. We want more books. See all these books? We need more. <laughs> we need more books. 
In um, fact, we, we have meetups and they're really successful. Um, Milda, what are the stats on that? We, yeah, we have oh, some God, impressive the stats. stats. Are ridiculous. It's like if you attend the meetups, if you attend them, 75% of your goals are met. Like on a week to week basis, you meet 75% of your goals. So you can imagine what, when you are a person who is like, I don't get my stuff done. Like, if you have a bullet journal and you turn the page and it's like, it's not done that day. Like it's the, the accountability groups are, are astonishing and, and they're real authentic communities. They're, uh, they're groups of people and they learn to love you as a human being. And then they care that you actually wrote your next page. Like who in your life cares that you finished your page? <laughs> we do. But um, I do want to let you know that we are at the end of our time. We're actually over time. And as usual, when it's like this brilliant, we just let it go. But um, but I want to thank the um, Poetry Foundation and the DeGroote Foundation for being our sponsors. Thank you. Also, we are funded by NISCA, the NEA, and by the LMCC, the um, the, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. So uh, we do thank our sponsors. We hope you become one of our sponsors. Uh, your donations are tax deductible and we need sponsors. Also, we need board members. So if you have been on an arts board, get in touch. We would like Wait, to talk to you. Uh, and Aaron, Christina, tell um, us about next week. Do you, yes, well, hold month. on one second. Erin, oh, okay. um, just to answer your question about meetups oh. outside of New York City. Um, yes, they're are, online. Most of them are on Zoom, so um, you, you can be anywhere. So you can be look, anywhere. Look us up and um, get in touch and get into one of the Zooms and and we'll help you meet other people yeah. that are in DC as well. We, we 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 really are trying to build, you know, our online community is really really tight, and they tend to meet offline as well and like find and, each and other. And you see these amazing authors here. You can do that. Like you can yeah. be one of them. I you mean, they they're amazing, and they've done amazing <laughs> things. And I hope they inspire you and mm -hmm. make you realize you can do it also. Mm -hmm. um, Christina, what are we doing next month? So next month um, is our holiday salon. Yay! And we're, we're actually going to do something we've never done before. Um, I, the theme is sort of around Ask the Busy Parent. Uh, and what I wanted to do, um, we're going to have some authors talking about um, their, their work and how they get it done and, um, you know, how children, you know, are in that fold. but. We will we'll also have Milda reading next month because she has a book out and um, we never ever and because of our own horn here, but I just felt it was really important after all these years, I've been with Pen Prentice 10 years, but Milda's been doing this for a while, mm -hmm. that, um, that we give her a little platform to show her work. So I hope you will join us for next Not month. Not just, but I am giving you guys a gift. It is an ask me anything. Like you, anybody who comes in December can do, look at this. Look at this beautiful thing here, Jennifer. Let's put Jennifer up. Um, Jennifer said, single mom here, kids with disabilities who will basically always be little. She's so inspired and she's going to join an accountability group. And Jennifer, Wonderful. we will be happy to have you. So thank you for joining. So um, next, besides and, Milda, we're also going to have um, Kerry Bertino and Ben Berman. Okay. And they're so, both productivity experts in parenting. Uh, he wrote a book that is only essays about himself writing and how he did it with his kid. And then she has her own mom group where she deals with moms. And, you know, of course, we deal with all the genders all the time. And we're a nonprofit, so, you know, we're really cheap. Anyway, but, uh, but we are so, so glad that you all came. And we're glad that anybody over the, on the playback is listening to us. And we're really grateful to Marina and Michael and Nancy for sharing their yes, wonderful work. Yes, thank words. you. Taylor, thanks for showing up. And Sarah, you're out there. Thanks so much. Um, you guys, we are at the end of our time.